Mark chapter 9. Let's look at verse 1. For those without a Bible, uh, it's on the screen. And he said to them, these words are in red, it's Jesus. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste or see death until they see the kingdom of God coming in all its power and glory. What a statement. Now, six days after this, he took Peter, James, and John. And so they would see the kingdom before their death. And he led them on a high mountain by themselves, left the nine uh, at the bottom. And he was transfigured before them. Mark says his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses. Somehow they were recognizable by uh, Peter, James, and John. And they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. We figured out why you brought us here. Let us make three tents or tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say. So when you don't know what to say, what should you do? Say nothing at all, right? Uh, Peter's, he's learning. And they were terrified, I guess they were. Verse 7 says, a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Hear or listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone but only Jesus there. Have you ever had a spiritual encounter or revelation that was so transcended it like altered the trajectory of your life, the way you make decisions? Now, I'm not talking about becoming a Christian. Uh, That's the ultimate experience. And if you haven't had that experience, you can, right? That's where you enter from death into life. It's grand, it's glorious. Uh, That is a God moment for sure. But I'm talking about like uh, an experience where you're born again again, right? I think in the Christian life, you get about five or seven of these if you're lucky in a lifetime. Uh, This God moment that's just so real, so transcendent, you want to tell everybody about it. Uh, Sometimes they happen at conferences or retreats where you go away and the speaker's teaching something that's new. It's not new, it's new to you and oh my gosh, it's life changing and you want to call everybody and tell them about it. Hey, you should all be here, I'm learning this and that. Maybe it's an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you receive a prayer language or begin to move in the gifts of the Spirit for the first time. Uh, We see a lot of this at Calvary where people have what we call a grace explosion, where a lot of their life was legalism or Christian life was like drudgery, and then all of a sudden grace changes everything. They begin to realize not only are they saved by grace, but that God has given us grace to live, and it's like they're on a honeymoon with God all over again. Some people discover the word of God uh, afresh. They've been starving for years and years and years, and then they come to a church, and they begin to read the word of God, and boom, everything changes, and it's just a life-altering experience. Some of my favorite ones are songs, like brand new songs that come out. The first time I sing them, hear them on the radio or at a, at a conference, and I'm just like, just God moves in my heart that way. One of my God moments of many uh, happened the first time I saw Jerusalem. I was 35 years old. And I walked off that bus, it was dusk, I think they planned it that way on the tour, and I'm looking at the city, maybe the most ancient city in the world, the place that David purchased the threshing floor there, and Abraham offered Isaac, and Jesus ministered, and I'm like, oh God, it was such a God moment. Well, if you've ever had these experiences that Peter, James, and John had, um, we call these mountaintop experiences. And it all comes here from Mark chapter 9 where Peter, James, and John are taken on top of the mountain. Now, everybody wants to know where this mountain is. And uh, it's probably Mount Hermon. It can only be Mount Hermon or Mount Tabor if you're familiar with the Galilee area. It's been a six-day journey. But you know what my answer to that question is? What mountain was it? Who cares? And thank God we don't know. Because man, (laughs) man, man is an incurable shrine builder. And if we knew this was on a particular mountain, we would have built a shrine there and everybody would flock there and they would sell trinkets. And uh, if you read the Bible, you'll be surprised. God never enshrines anything. Now, there were times where God said, build some stones of remembrance that you might remember this place. But do you remember what he said to Moses? Moses, everywhere your foot treads is holy. That's holy ground. Everywhere your foot goes, Moses, God never enshrined places, but you know what he did enshrine? A day. Keep holy the Sabbath day. He kept that holy because it's transcendent. 
Anyway, that's a whole nother talk. Back into what we're talking about. Um, this is a mountaintop experience where Jesus, listen, is transfigured before them. Now, we don't use the word transfigured. Uh, we hear a lot about transgender. Trans means to move across. So a caterpillar, when it becomes a butterfly, moves across, right? Jesus, all of man, all of God moves from at least the disciples' perception, his manhood to his deity. He's transfigured. His glory shined out. Let's look at it this way. Christmas, right? Luke tells the story of the incarnation. Uh, because Luke's a doctor, we get the birth canal, the swaddling clothes, right? The baby in the manger, right? Physical baby. Think of John's Christmas story. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And listen, he dwelt or tabernacled among us. Does anybody remember what the tabernacle was? The tabernacle was the portable meeting space in the wilderness later on in Israel before they built the temple where man would meet with God. When the tabernacle became permanent, i.e. the temple, uh, you, have to, you have to think, you have to remember this, Jews did not go to the temple like we go to church, okay? They would go to the temple to sacrifice animals. They would go there to sing. There were courtyards, women in one courtyard, men in another courtyard, Gentiles in another courtyard. The only people allowed into what was called the holy place were the priests, and even that was by lottery. And so there's a picture we have on the screen where priests, think of John the Baptist. Remember um, his father drew lots to go in and serve with the altar of incense and the showbread and, and, and those things. There was a veil, right, like this curtain here. There was the thick veil, top to bottom, that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. In the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant, where once a year the high priest would go in and meet with God, and he had a rope around his ankle with bells on it, because if they didn't hear the bells, he died and they were going to yank him out. Now, I want you to think of another mountain. This is very important. Moses is on this mountain with Jesus and Elijah, right? Remember when Moses went up the mountain uh, <laughs> to meet with God? The mountain was thundering and quaking, and the people said, Moses, look, you go up and talk to God. We'll, we'll stay at the bottom of the mountain. We trust you. Moses goes up, receives the Ten Commandments, and then he says to God, God, I want to see your glory. And God says, Moses, no one can see my glory and live. And God does a really cool thing. He hides Moses in the cleft of a rock and his afterparts. He said, Moses, you can see my afterparts. My gosh, I'd love to know what that looked like or what that is. Moses comes down the mountain, right? For those who remember the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston comes down with the white hair. Remember, he's all... Does anybody remember from the Bible what he was wearing? A veil. He had a veil over his face. Because the glory, the radiance, right? Jesus, Galatians says, great is the mystery of godliness, he took on a human body. Jesus' glory was veiled from you and me, those living then, by a human body. Uh, the writers of Hark the Herald Angels Sing had great theology. Christ by heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, there's Luke's story, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as men with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. He was veiled in his flesh. So Jesus comes, he's unveiled before them. This becomes the apex of his ministry. This is the height of the gospel. Mark's the first gospel writer. This is the pinnacle. Peter's made the grand confession, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Now Jesus is transfigured. This is the height of it all, guys. Here's my question. Why was it necessary? Why is it recorded? Why was it necessary? Three easy answers. We'll try to make Sunday very easy. Ready? The disciples needed it. Jesus needed it. And we need it. Okay, I'm going to walk you through those three things. Disciples needed this experience, at least three of them. Jesus needed it, and we need it. Why did this disciples need this experience? Guys, life is difficult. God asks us to do hard things, doesn't he? Like walk by faith, not by sight. Like the, the problem with Israel coming out of Egypt is they had to follow a God they could not see, and they didn't even know his name. There was no representation of this God. They were coming out of the land of idols. You and I are called to 
swim upstream, to go against the flow, like all the ideology and the isms of our day are all against us. My gosh, I've been reading Hebrews 11. It's kind of like my saturation chapter these days. And I'm just amazed at what God called people to do. Abraham staggered at the promises of God. Uh, I was watching the Nativity, the movie about the birth of Jesus. It's kind of a musical. It was in first-run theaters. And I'm like, of course God had to show Joseph and Mary angels. They would have never got the job done. Like, it was so hard. Paul was taken to the third heaven, right? And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm reading N.T. Wright's biography on Paul. And I'm like, yeah, for Paul to do all this, I guess he did have to go to the third heaven. And so sometimes God gives us what I call a little extra push. So I raised four kids, and uh, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag and tell you that grown kids are harder than younger kids because you guys will give up, but we'll leave that for another time. <laughs> the three hardest things about raising kids, in my view, potty training, riding a bike, and handing the car keys over. Wait till you hand those car keys over, my goodness. Anyway, riding a bike is stinking hard, right? Now, I know some of you have these wonder kind kids where they get on the bike and they just take off, right? We didn't have those kids. We had the training wheels. And then the training wheels come off. And then you run with your hand on the saddle, right? And then there comes that day where you got to let, you got your little finger and they got the helmet and they're going to fall over. And it, oh, it's horrific, right? And then they get it and they go and it's all one. Well, I think God moments, mountaintop experience, it's kind of like God taking the training wheels off and he's got his finger on our life. And it's his way of saying, look, I'm here. Yeah, I know you got a Bible, and I know you got your quiet time, and I know you go to church, but I want to give you some transcendent moments so you know I'm here. These are what God moments are about. These are mountaintop experiences. I know you've all had them. I, I, I know we've had them, and, and, and I, I just think God gives us this little extra push. Here's why the disciples needed a push. They only knew Jesus after the flesh. Of course they had seen miracles. They had seen the feeding of 5,000. They had seen lepers healed. They had seen a lot, guys, but they knew Jesus after the flesh. Um, I didn't Google this. There's probably thousands of pictures of Jesus counting paintings. I mean, there's the Italian Jesus, the French Jesus, the black Jesus, the Chinese. I mean, go Google it. There's so many pictures. And yet the Bible never tells us what he looks like. But Isaiah gives us a little insight in chapter 53. He said, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. This idea that Jesus was the only non-Jew in Israel, this beautiful Hollywood figure, is ridiculous. He was average, and in my opinion, I'll bet you 100 bucks he was below average, because that was the rest of his life. He had nowhere to lay his head. Um... No money. Uh, I think Jesus was about as average in the flesh as anyone you had ever met. And so they see his glory. They see the glory come out of him. Now Peter, <laughs> Peter's the spokesman. He's like, aha, I know why us three are built up, brought up here. Because we could build three booths. One for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. You know what Peter was saying? I think we should stay here. It's really nice up here. You're here, Mo Elijah's here, Moses here, the glory's here. Like, can we stay a while? In fact, we'll build three booths, right? Man's an incurable booth, shrine builder. The booth was a tabernacle. It was to protect them from that. Remember, they were terrified, right? Instead, a voice comes out of heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Now, six days ago, Peter didn't want to hear him. Because when Peter had that grand revelation, you're the Christ, Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. That has come from heaven, not from man. And then he said, the son of man, this is the first time he mentions the cross. The son of man must now go to Jerusalem, suffer, die, and be resurrected. <laughs> and what did Peter say? Not on my watch. I never signed up for Jerusalem, the cross. I, you know, guys, God calls us to hard things. I mean, when Jesus said, follow me, they dropped their nets. That's amazing. And he said, you're going to see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. But they never signed up for suffering. It was never in the playbook. 
that the cross was involved. The day you gave your life to Christ, there was a whole lot of things not in the playbook. They weren't mine. And yet God's called us to go through them. This is my beloved son, hear him. Six days previous, they didn't want to hear him. And now God's saying, hear him. You're going to see the kingdom in all its glory. I want to leave you with this on this point. The disciples needed this. They really did. But mountaintop experiences, as great as they are, cannot be the anchor of your faith. They can't be. You know how I know? Because Peter wrote later about this in 2 Peter, and he said, when we made known to you the coming and the power of the Lord, we did not devise, cunningly devise fables. These weren't myths. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were on the holy mountain. We saw this with our own eyes. However, we have a more prophetic word. We have a, a sure word of prophecy. You know what Peter was saying? As grand as the experience was, and I'll, I'll take it to my grave, the word of God is the anchor to our soul. They went back and looked at the 350 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his first coming in his death and resurrection. And he said, that's a more sure word of prophecy. Guys, experiences are great. You can't live off experience. You need the more sure word of God. The second thing is, Jesus needed this. I know what some of you are thinking. Pastor Bob, that's blasphemous. Why in the world would Jesus need this? Great is the mystery of godliness. I'll keep repeating this. He took on a human body. What that means is you can't figure that out. You can run around to every theologian in the world. Nobody's going to tell you how you could be all of God and all of man. They just can't. Great is the mystery of godliness, right? So somehow Jesus, in the flesh, living a life like you and me, Hebrews tells us was tempted in many ways like us. The only clue that we really have of what was going on here is told to us by Matthew and Luke, where they tell us that Elijah and Moses, Elijah represents the prophets, Moses the law, were speaking to Jesus about his departure, his exodus, his death. I love that. Uh, death for the Christian is a departure. You know, you go to the airport, the terminal, it's like Miami, San Francisco, Detroit. That's all death is for us, like heaven. That's our new destination. Let's get into some conjecture. It's kind of fun, right? Like, I hope you guys sit around and talk about stuff like this. Um, so I've read enough commentaries over 30 years, and you see stuff like this, and you ponder it, and it's, you don't know if it's true, but it's kind of cool to talk about. There are people that believe that Jesus, somewhere around 33 years old, transfigured, could have departed to heaven. Let that sink in. Why? Well, he had lived a sinless, perfect life. He was the second Adam. The first Adam gave everything away. Jesus proved that a man, he was all of God, all of man, he proved that a man could live a life one with God. He could have departed and gone to heaven. Now let's go, let's, let's throw some more conjecture in there. You ever wonder what would have happened if Adam and Eve never sinned, right? You ever sit around and talk about that? I wonder what would happen if Adam and Eve never sinned. Some people believe maybe at 30 or 33, Adam and Eve would have transfigured to maybe what we call a resurrected body. Uh, think about this. Adam and Eve had flesh and blood like you and me. Because when Cain kills Abel, Abel's blood cries out from the ground, right? When the disciples meet Jesus, they think it's a ghost. And Jesus said, look, I'm not a ghost. Come touch, touch, touch my hands. He said, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bone. No blood this time. So there seems to be a difference between forms, at least, right? Guys, I'm not saying this is all true. I'm just saying this is cool to talk about. It's conjecture, right? Um, some people say, well, if Adam and Eve never sinned and the human race never sinned, well, all of humanity would never fit here. Well, did you know you could put the whole human race, right now, 8 billion people, in Rhode Island? You know that? So, so there's enough space is the idea. And how do you know we would have stayed here, right? This is all cool stuff. I don't know if any of it's true, but it's cool, right? The point is, this becomes the apex of Jesus' ministry. The declaration, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then the transfiguration. 
By the way, confession always precedes revelation. So many people want a revelation of God, but notice Peter's confession came first. Then he saw the revelation. Here's what's important, and here's why Jesus needed this. He who knew no sin, who lived a perfect life, was about to become sin. You know what sin does? Separates you from God. That's what hell is, separation from God. The Bible says the way of a backslider is hard. Someone who knows Christ and all of a sudden begins to dabble in the world, they stop going to church, stop hanging around their friends, stop going to Bible study. They're miserable because they're separated. Jesus, for the first time, would be separated from God. Again, it's a mystery. It's unthinkable. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? We'll never be able to plumb the depths of that. The idea of him being separated from God, this was kind of a pick-me-up on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. If you think that's blasphemous, ask, answer or ask yourself this question. Why was the te temptation in the wilderness a temptation? Satan said, bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Why was that a temptation? It had to be as real as Adam's temptation to eat of the tree in the center of the garden. To bypass the cross, to not be separated from the Father, had to be real. The writer of the Hebrews says Jesus was tempted with every temptation just like you and me. That's what makes him a great high priest. I think this was his pick-me-up on the mountain where he meets with Elijah and Moses who had gone before him. G. Campbell Morgan said the supreme and master passion of the heart of the perfected man was, perfect, was for, the, for the perfecting of the men who suffered and bringing back to the kingdom its true and rightful king. The disciples needed to see the transfiguration. Jesus needed to be on that mountain. And you ready for this? You and I need it. Now you're probably thinking, Pastor Bob, that happened 2,000 years ago. Why would we need to know Jesus was transfigured on that mountain? We have the resurrection. We have the New Testament. Uh, look at verse 14. When they had come down the mountain. Here's your lesson for the day. As glorious and grand as your mountaintop experiences and God moments will be, we shall always come down the mountain. And guys, when we come down the mountain, it ain't good. It ain't good. Jesus comes down the mountain, squabbling scribes, sick kid, helpless father, helpless disciples. Always got to come down the mountain. You know what happens when you come down the mountain? You come back to life. Go to a women's retreat. Oh, God's going to change the world. You come back. <laughs> Kids, life, work, right? We come down the mountain. Years ago, my wife Monica was doing uh, youth ministry, and she went out to Pittsburgh to a uh, youth specialties conference, and she comes home, and she goes, look, I'm not going to dump the conference on you. I know you've been with the kids, but listen to this tape. It was tape cassettes way back when, and it was Gary Halgan. Nobody knew who Gary Halgan was at the time. Uh, he would start IJM, and he was like on the forefront of rescuing women out of sex trafficking, and Gary actually spoke here at our church, and we had this traveling brothel that would go everywhere. It was just a glorious time in the season of our life. But it all started with Monica on a mountaintop experience in Pittsburgh. But she was smart enough to say, I'm not going to dump the conference on you. It's actually a sign of immaturity when God does something in your life and you run around trying to convince everybody that's what they should be doing. I say it all the time. People actually do it to me all the time. Pastor Bob, I just found out about this or that, and you should be talking about this every single week. Well, if God wants me to talk about it, I'm pretty sure he can get through to me. You know what I'm saying? It's a sign of immaturity when God shows up in your life and you want to dump it on everybody else. Now, if you want to share it in love and lead people, that's a beautiful thing. But don't come down to your spouse or your kids and try and dump everything on them. By the way, Peter, James, and John come down the mountain, they're helpless. They had a mountaintop experience and they can't help anybody. Jesus calms down the scribes, he heals the kid, calms the father. The reason why we need to know about this experience is there are times when we need to know Jesus is at the right hand of God. <laughs> the Apostles' Creed, right? He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. 
There are times where life gets so difficult. That's all I need to know. I've been reading Hebrews in my devotional time just, just to read, not to preach, just to read. And it's been so great to read those chapters about to, 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 to what angels has he done this and that. Today you're my son. Sit at my right hand and make your enemies your footstool. That we should draw near to the throne of grace because he's a great high priest. I, I've been letting that just filter over me and wash over me because there are times where I need to know he's at the right hand of God. He's making intercession. The one who created the heavens controls everything in this world. He controls kings and kingdoms and situations and there are times I need to know that. I need to know he's all of man and he died for him, but I need to know he was all of God. You know, when I was preaching through this, I thought about Judas. Right, Judas was at the confession. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said, there's some here who will never taste death till they see the kingdom. And he takes Peter, James, and John. And they saw the kingdom and then, and then the other eight saw the resurrection. And I'm thinking, but Judas never saw anything. A man that traveled with Jesus for three years never saw any of this. He was like the children of Israel. He saw miracles, he saw healings, and it was never mixed with faith. And it never worked. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you could be this close, this close to the truth. If there's anybody in this room that doesn't know Christ, maybe you've been investigating Christianity, maybe somebody brought you here. Guys, you could get this close to the truth and, and nothing happens. Judas, the other thief on the cross, this close to the truth. The Bible says it has to be mixed with faith. These people saw the kingdom. I wanna end real quick with this. I talked about God moments, mountaintop experiences. And some of you have had them, some of you have had a lot. Some of you are sitting here and like, I'm a Christian. I've never had these. And you feel like a second class citizen. Or maybe you've had a few, but it's been a while. So I wanna give you two suggestions. Ready? They're groundbreaking. I thought for weeks about this. <laughs> Kidding. Number one, do you ever think about asking? I did a whole series in September where Jesus said, ask, and what happens? It'll be given. Moses said, Lord, I want to see your glory. Uh, by the way, he was the meekest man, the most humble man on the earth, and he had to write that in the Bible. That's weird, and so you think he wasn't humble, but he was. We would think that was arrogant, right? Like, oh, I'll just sit in the back of the kingdom, and I'll be lucky to get in. No, no. Lord, I want to see your glory. It's a dangerous prayer, by the way. Gary Haugen probably prayed that prayer. Lord, I want to see your glory. And God put him in Cambodia taking women out of sex trafficking, but he saw the glory. So ask. So I received my prayer language the day I was saved. Monica didn't. And for four months in her bedroom, she prayed, and boom, one day it happened. She asked, right? I had a business friend of mine. I watched him go through peaks and valleys. And he would constantly ask God what to do, what to do, and boom, God gave him a vision and he sold his business, and oh my gosh, it was glorious. All right, real quick, second idea. This is groundbreaking, took me weeks to think about it. If you want to have a God experience, sometimes you got to get off your butt. <laughs> Christians want to be injected like they're on a cruise ship. Give me a God experience. God wants to be sought. So when you go deep sea fishing, the fish don't jump into the boat, do they? You gotta go miles out. You gotta throw the reel out. I was reading Jay Wright's book, uh, former coach of Villanova, and they had a chaplain that he loved. And the chaplain uh, told a joke. So this is a joke. It's bad theology, but it's a joke. And the joke was there was a woman who said, you know, God, I'm down on my luck. I'm down on my finances. The kids need shoes. And so, Lord, uh, help me to win the lotto. A week goes by, she prays again, Lord, I'm down on my luck, the kids need shoes, they need something to eat. Lord, help me win the lotto. Third week, she's about to pray, Lord, kids need shoes, they need clothes. And she's about to say, Lord, I need to win the lotto. And to which God says, have you ever thought about buying a ticket? That's bad theology, right? 
In fact, every time we have a campaign, somebody comes up to me and says, Bob, you're gonna be able to build this new wing because I'm playing the lotto every day and God's gonna make me win and you'll be able to, I'm like, no, no, that's not how it works. You need to come to one of our home meetings. We'll talk about that. Um, sometimes you gotta get off your butt. I was 24 years old. Monica was nine months pregnant. Didn't have two nickels to rub together. There was a preacher I watched on TV who was having a pastor's conference. I went to my wife and said, God told me to go. I'm not a pastor, you're pregnant. We scrounged up the money, we got on a plane nine months pregnant, altered the trajectory of my life and it was nothing that was spoken on the stage, it was the people we met. I talked about the God moment of Israel. I had to get on a plane, I had to buy the ticket, I had to go. I could go on and on and on. Sometimes you gotta get off your butt. Hear the voice of God and obey. As Eugene Peterson said, this is a long obedience in the same direction. And guess what? Some of the things God's gonna call you to do are countercultural, and they will cost. But he will show up and it will be grand and you will have a God moment and a mountaintop experience and it will dissipate and it will go away and we go back to chopping wood and living life. We can't live from God moment to God moment, but there are those moments and we need to hold out for them. God, we thank you that your face shines upon us. Lord, I pray for every person here whose heart beats for you. God, that they would seek you with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength. That we would listen for your voice, Lord. We know it's not easy. We live in a fallen world crazy stuff going on. But God, there are these moments, whether they're in a coffee shop, in our room, in a seat like this, listening to a song. God, help us to know you're there. We know it in theory. Help us to know it in reality. And we thank you for what you've already done. And Lord, we're gonna sing this song as a prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen.